Hello folks, my name is Philippe Saladay and I'm a board certified behavior analyst at Cornerstone Autism Center. In this video, we'll show an interview we were able to do with Dr. Susan Friedman. Dr. Friedman is a psychology professor at Utah State University who has pioneered the application of applied behavior analysis to captive and companion animals. She has also worked with many organizations all over the world, conducting lectures, workshops, and trainings in order to disseminate essential tools and principles for effective and ethical animal care. I saw that Dr. Friedman was scheduled to conduct a seminar at the Wolf Park in West Lafayette, Indiana. I thought this would be a great opportunity to have a guest speaker for our staff, but due to COVID, we were unable to meet in person, but she was kind enough to do an interview through Zoom. Through our chat, she described her introduction to the field of behavior analysis through direct care work with teenagers addressing challenging behavior and developing appropriate alternative skills. We also discussed her transition of applying ABA to the animal population. And she also imparted some advice for professionals who are seeking to make a difference through behavior analysis. I hope you enjoy this discussion with Dr. Susan Friedman. Dr. Friedman, will you go ahead and kind of give us a brief uh, overview of your work and uh, your experience? I know that you have a broad influence in your field, so we'll take some time to do that. Yeah. Um, so can you hear that little squeaking sound in the background? Just I don't little. mind to share this with your audience as part of the antecedent arrangement to increase the probability of quiet dogs. I gave my dog a toy, <laughs> not realizing it was a squeaky toy, which of course is part of the feedback for chewing on it, the reinforcer that maintains that behavior. So I might need to just reach up and exchange that toy for something quiet, but we'll see. But you can see that I really view every single thing in um, the world that I come in contact with it really in little ABC units, little antecedent behavior consequence units. And um, so I am truly, uh, my mentor called Chini uh, once bestowed me with a great uh, compliment. He said, you're truly a, a lifestyle behavior analyst. And I think that really fits. I, I really uh, bring it with me and am immersed in seeing the world through this natural science of behavior and behavior change. Um, my background, you're right, it's difficult to do that briefly because I never know what's going to be of interest. Um, I graduated uh, from a small college in, uh, with a degree in psychology and sociology. And then my first job, the amazing good fortune of having my first job be at a residential treatment center with Wells Hively, who was with Ogden Lindsley, one of Skinner's first um, education doctoral students two of them. So I had this incredible opportunity to really learn our science from people who were steeped in it themselves and uh, really movers and shakers in uh, the research, new research areas applying the science of behavior change to children with autism and other learning needs. Um, and then from there, I got my doctorate at Utah State University. Uh, uh, taught at the University of Colorado in Boulder for a few years. And then with my husband and children, we left for Africa for five years. Oh, wow. um, yeah, which was really an expanding, as you can imagine, experience to be set in a completely different cultural box uh, where antecedents and consequences have many different nuances to them to learn. And um, when we came back, I got a parrot as a pet which was a really bad idea. I've come to learn a flighted animal in your living room. You'd think I would have known, but my consciousness has been greatly raised over the last 20 years. And when I studiously read up on how to care for this bird, it was so filled with punishment suggestions. It was really shocking to me. Um, if the bird bites you, drop it on the floor. Um, if you say to the bird to step onto your hand, force it, just don't let it get away with not listening. I mean, it was really um, uninformed or what I've come to call informed by the cultural fog. And so I started writing in the area, just little pop magazine articles, introducing the ABCs. And before you, knew, you know it, it got attention from people who were um, 
running conferences and different kinds of educational concerns. And uh, we all got connected. And so here I am today with a, a 20 plus year career in applying behavior analysis to non-human learners in zoos and as pets. That's very cool. Now it's, <laughs> I did a deep dive into your work and some of the workshops that you put on and the interviews that you've had with other professionals in your specific field of animal training and animal work. And it was just really interesting to see behavior analysis used in that way. And, you know, I'm not in that field. And so to see just your impact of bringing that to, you know, bird trainers in particular, but then in other aspects of dog training and working with zoos and on multiple different species is, is pretty incredible. So I'm excited to talk even it's more. It's been a blast. Yeah. And yeah. so how did you find your way into behavior analysis? Uh, it really was through that uh, residential treatment center, Spalding Youth Center in, in New Hampshire. Um, and it was the result of just looking for work post-college and having a hard time finding it. Um, I remember very clearly the one chapter in my psychology course on Skinner. And I remember being really, it was very appealing to me. It made so much sense. It really appealed to my sense of order and how the world works. So I remember being um, drawn by that magnetic pull a bit then but didn't really have any um, depth to the instruction in a whole four-year psychology degree, one chapter, right? right. Um, something we really need to continue to work on doing something about. And um, so meeting those behavior analysts at the center and working with them for three years really opened up that world. The kids were I always say sort of the worst behaving humans on the planet. You know, they were adolescent male inner city kids who were thrown out of their states and sent to New Hampshire. Um, so it was a really important application and a very difficult application to succeed at. So when people say to me now, you know, they have an elephant who's tusking its um, wrist and causing injury. I'm like, oh yeah, I know that behavior. It just didn't have a trunk, right? Right. <laughs> no, behavior's behavior. I, it's amazing that you got that experience. Sure I know Ogden uh, Lindsley, he was the one that really promoted precision teaching. Is that right? That's right. And it's an important name and a, an important um, subject area for all behavior analysts to participate in, to learn and to use, um, because it answers that question, how do you know that? You know, that's our most important question is, people ask me all the time, is the orangutan depressed? That was one of my first consultancies from the LA Zoo. And I answered, you know, what does depression look like? And, you know, how do I know that? What's our measure? Mm -hmm. And uh, precision teaching goes a long way to answering that essential question. You, I mean, touched on this a little bit with the example with the elephants and the self-injury, but how else have you seen that kind of generalization of skills, that experience in both of these fields, first, you know, with working with children, adolescents, and then now with animals, how has that benefited you as a behavior analyst? Well, I've really learned a lot from working with animals that I didn't know. Working with human animals, non-human um, yeah. animals have, have taught me about the value of, of checking in on the natural history of the species, you know, what they were evolutionarily designed to do, given the environments in which they evolved. Of course, when we bring them into human care, now they're in a different environment. And people are often from a biology, zoology, or ethology background, natural behavior, so-called natural behavior. And just like working with children and parents and teachers who are not educated in behavior analysis, they tend to put the behavior, the cause of the behavior inside the organism. So as I explained, the, you know, I mentioned the orangutan 
is depressed, it has depression, um, or uh, the, the bird uh, attacks or the dog lunges because it has aggression or it um, destroys the things in the house because it has separation anxiety. And what happens is those construct labels as we know them as behavior analysts become reified. They become treated not as concepts, but as tangible entities. And then they're looking in the wrong place for solutions. They're looking inside the animal, which leads them to the pathological model, the medical model, and away from, as Paul Chance says so beautifully in his intro textbook, um, away from looking at causes we can do something about. And that's the way the environment is singling behavior and then selecting or deselecting for behavior. So that's really our contribution is to say, even if there may be organic involvement, brain disease or other kinds of um, biophysical disease or dysfunction, the environment will always have some influence over behavior. And as long as we hold on to that um, fact, that demonstrated natural science fact that there is no brain, there is no behavior without the environment, um, then we will always have a big contribution to make, which is how far can we take those behavior problems just by rearranging or engineering the environment. So that's really the, the nut of it, the impetus and the passion behind it is you're looking in the wrong place. Or even if you're not in an interdisciplinary team, we'll have the veterinarian, they can look in the place that's right for them. Uh, the, the environment will always contribute to the effectiveness of medication um, and influence the behavior. No, it's, As we know, yeah. It's, it's so necessary to have a multiple, multiple disciplinary team to kind of work through those things and to, for a behavior analyst to be a part of that process. Um, mm -hmm. So as you're working with those teams and a lot of individuals that are rooted into kind of their own mindsets, their own learning histories, the, the fog that you right. talked about, how do you create buy-in for those behavior analytic principles? Yeah, that's something I have spent, uh, 20 years trying to uh, become more effective at is getting people to hear that once they hear it and we can demonstrate it, then it's going to have a huge impact on their understanding of the world. Um, but getting people to open up to a completely different way of looking at things that is not only different than their deep education, but also the culture the cultural explanations for behavior that we have is really a, a very difficult thing. And it takes a lot of ambassadorial skills, you know, which are endless in, in collecting. Um, I found that the, the best way in working with animal people is to come in through the evolutionary history door, hmm. which was not really part of my training as a special educator. Um, I didn't ever stop to think, nor do I remember reading about in, in you know, um, Milton Burrow or uh, the White Book or, you know, right. any of our main special ed sources, th this notion of a behavior as an evolved tool, part of our biology that is necessary to operate on the environment to cope with an ever-changing world. That really opened doors for me to talk to biologists and zoologists is to say it isn't nature nurture, it is our nature, it is our biology, our evolutionary history to change what we do based on experience and imagine a world where we didn't have that capacity. So it's fun. I often start my, um, my presentations to behavior analysts, veterinarians, animal trainers, zoologists, what are your eyes for? And they'll indulge me and yell back to see. What are your ears for to hear? What are your legs for to run? What's behavior for? And there's always a silent moment. They don't have, even behavior analysts do not have 
a really fluent, ready, you know, yeah. short latency response to that question. But even a two-year-old can answer what your eyes and ears are for, right? So um, being able to give people that answer to operate on the environment, to get reinforcers, to get away from punishers, um, it is our evolved control over an environment that is influencing us, that is controlling us. And uh, that has really allowed me, I think, to get the forum open a little bit more when I come in from that evolutionary history explanation of behavior. That's great. I really love you kind of working off of their own understanding and the things that are they're passionate about already to help them kind of understand behavior analysis more. I think that for us, you know, even working with different families, different people of different ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds, it's important for us to understand, okay, what are they passionate about? You know, what kind of foundation do they already have that we can work off of to help them better understand behavior analysis? And so it can ultimately benefit them, right? That's right. That's a really good way to, to look at it. And that touches on one of our most important skills is the skill of observation, mm -hmm. is to be able to look, look at someone and quickly grok, if you will, you know, what is important to them, not in a negatively or nefariously manipulative way, right. but authentically, authentically to be able to observe a family and say, I see where they're coming from. And this is where our science and technology could help them. Yeah, in a relatable and empathetic way. Yeah. Absolutely. So to talk more about your field in particular, I mean, you discussed already how punishment was just highlighted in such a overused tool, particularly for the uh, bird species, the parrots. Um, how have you helped people understand the importance of reinforcement and you know, what even the effects of punishment are for these animals? Yeah, uh, another big think piece for me. What I did was um, I, I took Alberto and Troutman's four-step hierarchy of behavior reduction techniques, starting with the DRs, DRO, DRA, um, and going up to positive punishment. And I expanded that hierarchy so that uh, this hierarchy, and I can send you, I'm not sure, I don't think I did a recent article on this idea of applying the least intrusive principle to our, um, our behavior change plans. And that that's part of our ethical, should be part of our ethical standard is my argument, that effectiveness is not enough. So what I, I thought I observed, what I kind of the insight I hit on was that people who are proponents of punishment, who are teaching people to punish better, which means more severely, of course. Mm -hmm. um, what they were going for was understandable, it was effectiveness. And in my opinion, in my analysis, what they were missing was that effectiveness does not make a good sole criterion. Because if effectiveness is your only criterion, then it opens up all the different punishment solutions to behavior. It doesn't address antecedent arrangement, our most precious behavior change porthole, you know? And um, so I took this hierarchy, I started researching the least intrusive principle, found it in law, found it in uh, medicine, uh, found it in uh, bio biometrics. So this concept of a part of an ethical standard being that when we are changing people and asking them to change, that we do so using the least intrusive principle. So I built an extended principle from the Alberto and Trapman idea and um, started with um, wellness and the appropriate physical environment and appropriate nutrition. And then antecedent arrangement would be the next less intrusive, but maybe more than uh, rearranging the physical environment, then positive reinforcement, 
um, the DRs, negative reinforcement, extinction, and negative punishment and positive punishment is at the tip of the hierarchy where it should be used. It, there's big speed bumps on the graphic and a stop sign trying to convey to people that we do have all these um, tools available to us with laws of how to use them well. But what we need is an ethical standard overlay, overlaying the um, efficacy of the tools, pairing the two together, effectiveness and humane, or at least intrusive treatment. We can ask ourselves before we intervene, is this the least intrusive way to be effective? And if the answer is no, I can be effective with positive reinforcement without the extinction component of DRI or A, then I'm ethically bound to start there. So that's how I've addressed it. And that, that document's gone far and wide. It's, it's really that graphic has had um, a lot of that, its critics which is kind of neat in itself because, of course, the process of critic being criticized and critical debate allows you to polish what you know or learn new things. So I've welcomed that as well. I'll send you the more recent article. That'd be fantastic. You cut out a little bit with um, just at the end there talking about how that article has gone far and wide. Uh, yeah. Can you just briefly touch on that? It's been adopted by many zoos um, around the world in their uh, ethical statements. Great. And, um, and it's, for example, in the uh, major dog uh, professional organizations, it's part of their ethical standard, um, both the uh, Council for Pet Dog Training and the Association of uh, Dog Trainers. So it's really, it's gotten wide exposure. It's and it's interesting the 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 crit one of the critic the critics from behavior analysis are very interesting to me. Um, some people say that negative reinforcement shouldn't be as in the small part of the hierarchy used very rarely. It should be down further, closer to positive reinforcement. Hmm. And the reason why they argue that is because of our functional. Um, our functional bent, asking what is the function of the problem behavior? And if the function is escape, then we often start with uh, an escape um, treatment plan and then slowly switch over to selecting with positive reinforcement. So that's a really you know, interesting and valid um, argument to make. And it, it's causing me to think about um, you know, the function approach, the functional approach to solving behavior problems um, may need to be better represented in that, in future iterations of that idea of the hierarchy and the least intrusive principle. I think that's very important with whoever you're working with, whether it be animals or, or children, to not just take a simplified version of that, but really look into it because yes, I, can you use extinction for that challenging behavior? Sure, but could a different approach, a desensitization program, you know, using positive reinforcement to shape that behavior in a more intentional way, would that be more beneficial versus just an escape extinction process and forcing the right. individual to engage in it or some right. sort of flooding to have them be, you know, in this situation while you're still providing reinforcement, are there other effects? And like you said, could there be a more ethical way to address that behavior? It's something important for all of us to think about. Um, Absolutely. And it strikes at the heart of our expertise. So one of the issues for us to consider um, is how do you approach rolling out this science and te technology in a big scale? How do you scale it up um, for people who don't have master's degrees and PhDs in behavior analysis? Right. And um, have we not been well adopted and well exposed in the mainstream because we're such sticklers about our 
vocabulary and our functional approach and so forth. So working with animal trainers was an opportunity for me to decide how much of that technical accuracy mm. I might need to let go of mm. in order to keep people at the table, show demonstrated successes and that kind of thing. So there's always something complicated, you know, we all agree functional approaches are best and yet that takes a fair amount of expertise and education. So do we expect, um, you know, trainers to adopt that understanding today while the giraffe <clears throat> is licking persistently all the metal in the enclosure? Right. So there have been some interesting sort of um, social marketing elements and forks in the road that I've had to make decisions about and then and then revise based on the feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of figuring those things out, seeing what works. And I know for the field in general, it's been difficult to, you know, market uh, itself. Um, right. Even the stipulations that the field can kind of put on um, success stories and, and things of that nature, you know, you want to do it in an ethical way but you because you don't want to have there's this fear of um, a dual relationship or putting pressure on the person the client that you're working with but at the same time we want people to know the success that this field can have on these socially significant situations things that are so important for families for animals you know whatever it might be how right. do you do that while staying true to the principles that we hold on to it's, it's absolutely tough. it's a really difficult question and maybe we need to turn it on its head and, and ask instead how did the punishment orientation of a caesar milan mm. get the exposure that it got why yeah. is it that we fail to compete in that upscaled market with a science that is both effective and less intrusive yeah so yeah, we, we have a lot of work to do figuring that out. You mentioned, you know, some of these more well-known animal trainers, specifically dog trainers, um, with any field, whether it's, you know, psychology and kind of the Dr. Phil approach or, you know, with medicine, we have Dr. Oz and there are debates about it. You know, there's just a dramatization of those things. Um, but like you said, they can be publicized, even with Caesar and a more punishment uh, ridden approach. What is kind of the biggest difference between your approach working with animals and maybe some that we see um, on TV or on YouTube or whatever it might be? Yeah, you know, if you listen to Caesar, he, he always puts the, uh, he blames the victim of an <laughs> ill fit environment. It's the, it's the classic, what we see with children as well. Again, that idea of constructs used as explanations when we understand their concepts and concepts have no tangible form. So jealousy can't cause behavior, right? It can only name it. Yeah. And um, he's always labeling animals, <clears throat> which is, <clears throat> excuse me, his way of putting the problem inside the organism as if on necropsy, we're going to find jealousy next to the appendix, you know, of the dog. That appeals because it's, it speaks to the culture that people have grown up with. They too have been labeled in that way. Their behavior has been explained because they're just like Uncle John, you know, and um, we just don't have the orientation to look at the environment. So I am reminded of the beautiful Skinner quote, and there are so many, where he says something like, it's not enough to say that the individual is frustrated or anxious. We have to ask what induced the frustration and the anxiety. And the answer to that will always be, at least in part, in the environment. So that's a hot topic now too, emotions with animals. Mm -hmm. And we have the tools to be able to be influential parts of that discussion. Again, we can ask, what does it look like? What does jealousy look like? Um, the dog lunches at the end of the lead when another dog comes by. That's something we can do something about. The jealousy, we can't do anything about directly because it doesn't exist in any tangible form. 
So I think that's the biggest problem with, you know, all of them. I think when they are effective, you know, um, we can analyze the behavior analytically. You know, when we say, when we hear Dr. Phil, you know, say, well, how's that working for you? You know, we understand, you know, we're asking for verbal confirmation from a verbal community and we can select what we want from that response um, that, that might be more effective. And uh, so behavior analysis is always there, like gravity is always there, but it's, um, it's clothed in all of this cultural fog. Yeah. No, it's definitely our learning history is coming into play. I mean, even for me as a behavior analyst, I, I think listening to these different shows, having this having it be repeated through my history, you know, like you were saying with labels and how we explain it, um, even with my own pet, you know, kind of wondering what to do and maybe putting some of those hypothetical constructs and mentalistic explanations, uh, right. on the, you know, what she's doing and then kind of taking a step back and saying, okay, what's really at play and what would be a way to shape that? to change the environment what variables are happening you know, what are her reinforcers and That's versus right. you know having just a frustrated label put on there being anxious or being overly excited or whatever it might be right a hyperactive dog <laughs> all the labels that we push back on with children right. we, we have to push back on with non-human learners as well um you know, the differences are answered by studying the ethology of the animal, but the similarities when you're working with individuals is remarkable. It is truly one planet. Yeah, for sure. We're, we're talking with, or two, I should say, um, a bunch of RBTs, behavior analysts that I think are, I know from talking with them are very excited um, about hearing about your work and um, kind of hearing more about the opportunities they can uh, take to come into contact with behavior analysis as it uh, is applied to um, their own pets and some of the things that you're promoting. So would you go ahead and take some time to talk about those things? Yes, it's an important question, but it is a hard one because there isn't a, a, a ready answer yeah. yet. Um, universe, we are ahead of the curve in terms of identifying the need for behavior analytically trained um, consultants and trainers for non-human learners. So uh, is there, so when people, mm -hmm. is there a, a governing body um, that kind of oversees animal training or anything like that? No, there isn't. And um, so there is no certification right. um, that is, um, uh, connected to the legal use of the term, the label, you know, a certified animal behavior behaviors. There are certifications, but we always have to ask who's the certifier, you know, different organizations have come up with a certification program. So people can get diplomas and certifications from programs um, that document their education from that school or that organization. Some organizations have uh, small exams that learning and behavior is a part of. And those are all good steps in the right direction. I'm from the generation where there was no certification for behavior analysts either. And so anybody could call themselves a behavior analyst and um, the certification somewhat addresses that problem. That's a whole nother pot, uh, webinar for, or a meetup for us an, another time. Um, but to get into animal work, you know, my suggestion is that you get really strong education and experience with humans um, in behavior analysis. And then you look to see, <clears throat> can you find um, experiences to, um, uh, experiences mainly for supervised practice, mm -hmm. you know? So I teach an eight week course online that makes it more explicit how to connect the dots from behavior analysis to animal work. Um, and then people need to be able to go out there and do it with a supervisor. Um, and so another way of getting into it is just working with zookeepers, shadowing, you know, cleaning cages, figuring out what it's, what's going on in the animal world, because it's very much switching cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and, 
and model views, level of analysis views from behavior analysis to biology or zoology. So there's a lot to learn about our compatriots with that background. And um, I think that people need to enter it humbly. You know, one thing that behavior analysts are known for, maybe not your generation as much, I'm not sure you can tell me, is that we always have a certain amount of panache arrogance that comes with, I think, being a small discipline within psychology programs that are typically clinical psych or experimental psych or comparative psych. And um, we're always trying to get out from behind that eight ball of people misunderstanding what it is we do and um, what our research is investigating and what our conclusions lead us to. Um, I always say we're getting out from behind the clockwork orange, you know, we're manipulated, manipulative um, puppeteers and that kind of thing. Um, so entering into a new application, I think needs to be done very humbly because I often see young behavior analysts coming into animal forums and I see that bit of that arrogance or that little bit of push behind, you know, um, I was at a conference, uh, online conference the other day and a behavior analyst said uh, the trainers were talking about a construct and I just kept quiet because the point was not, it was not an opportunity to teach about constructs. It was an opportunity to listen. And this behavior analyst wrote in, oh, how would you operationalize that? And I thought, you see, there it is. You got to hold back on those reins a little bit and um, get to know the people that you're sitting with before you start telling them how wrong they are in their worldview and their approach to behavior change. So those are some ideas. Um, University of Kansas, Thomas Zane has become a good friend and he's taken quite a number of my animal students into his master's behavior analysis program and uh, made room for them to do their research with non-human learners. So that's great. Jesus Rosales Ruiz at Northern Texas um, does a great job of mentoring um, behavior analysts with animal, um, animal interests and he's contributed to the animal training world greatly as well. Um, and so uh, let's see Terry Bright at Simmons you know, so there are little pockets you can find, um, but it's we're definitely ahead of the curve on needing programs for this. That's cool. Now you talked about your own um, program that you have that kind of an eight week course. What's that called and where can they find that? Yeah, How Behavior Works, Living and Learning with Animals. LLA is what um, most people refer to it as. And on my website, behaviorworks.org, under professional courses, um, it, you, they can find it there. I teach it at the end of July and in January every year for eight weeks, um, morning in, in January and uh, evening so that we can so cover the world. I have had 52 different countries wow. represented in that course over these many years. So that's very exciting. And there are also articles on my web page that have been translated into 14 different languages um, that people can just kind of noodle around with and scan to get a good idea of how I've introduced the ABC assessment, um, the idea of function, um, selection by consequences, different categories of antecedent arrangement, you know, motivating operations and discriminative stimuli. So that's all there for people to enjoy, I hope. And then I have my Facebook page, which I use exclusively for um, sneaking in behavior analysis objectives. So I show a small and amazing video, probably twice a month. And then I put a little paragraph. And an interesting thing has happened. Um, the trainers themselves who share these videos with me have started to write the paragraph themselves about the training and something about behavior analysis. So it isn't always me doing that translation for them from their video. And so that you'll see a lot that start with in their own words. And that's something to notice because 20 years ago, trainers in general would not have been able to describe their training from a reinforcement perspective. That's cool. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think those are great suggestions. I, especially your website and the program that you put on, I, I've heard great things about it. Um, I think it, for anybody that's wanting to know more about, you know, living with an animal, they have a pet, I, I think it'd be a good opportunity to apply what we already know to that area of their life. Um, we have this dream manager program at Cornerstone where we try to figure out different aspects of our life and um, how we can accomplish goals and dreams. And one little um, bullet point is legacy. And we've had different folks want to be a part of dog shelters, you know, helping them uh, with walking dogs. And we've always kind of talked about, okay, how could we uh, help a shelter with behavior analysis, possibly helping animals become more adoptable or helping them in a different way, maybe for those interactions with people who are looking for a new pet. Do you have any suggestions for us on that? Well, that just makes my heart burst because I always teach my students that there are uh, three goals, at least in my life, and I suggest people considering it for theirs. And one is to do good and to make money, you got to eat. So we can talk about that openly, to do good, to make money, and to leave a legacy is the third one. Um, so that is such an exciting idea. Um, I really am, am thrilled to hear you offering that kind of support to one another. Um, and I think the shelters do need our information and our skills, but there is a, a small crevasse between what we know and our experience with humans mm -hmm. and translating it to non-humans. Yes. Um, so for example, they use a lot more, um, or they think they use, they talk about using a lot more um, Pavlovian solutions, systematic mm -hmm. desensitization and counter conditioning. Um, and for me, I had to really dive deep to learn more about that because I've always been an operant gal and I see the world in, with this empowerment as an operant, uh, an operating organism, not just a receiving um, organism. So I had to learn a whole lot more about those Pavlovian techniques. I had to look at flooding and why it's one of the most intrusive and therefore least desirable procedures and um, get up to date on the uh, discussions that merge Pavlovian and Skinnerian learning as one process, just different applications, which is a kind of newish, um, different way of looking. So there, in other words, there's still lots to learn. So I would recommend that people um, let those shelters know that you're there and you're interested to help, that you have this special expertise with um, behavior change with learners, that with demanding learners that you are new to um, applying it to non-human learners, but that there is a wonderful precedence for doing so, and that they would like to, to see if there's any way to help. And of course, shelters don't always only need help with behavior problems, they need help with changing the water bowls. Yeah, that's a, a great way to pair ourselves with reinforcement. And that's kind of right, exactly, to become a relationship reinforcer. Absolutely. Um, so as you said before, so eloquently, um, discovering where we can join up with them, where we can be helpful, and then we can unfold what we know kind of slowly. I mean, many times I just stand there shoulder to shoulder with a trainer or a shelter um, staff person, and I'll say, you know, there might be another way to look at this. You know, do you notice that when the dog jumps up, 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 that occasionally a piece of food is dropped? Mm. Um, somebody thinks it's cute. And I might just put it in very gently as a hypothesis um, and not, oh my goodness, you know, I know what, we, yeah. So kind of exaggerated, but in a less exaggerated way, that's often the way. We're so thrilled, we're so excited to have this powerful, helping toolkit, right. both science-based and socially relevant, that sometimes it's hard to be more strategic in how we let people know that we're there to help. So that definitely takes consideration.
but wow. shelters need us, no doubt about it. And if you want to look up Terry Bright, she's a name that comes to mind that has done exceptional work with shelter dogs in Massachusetts. The Angel, I forget the name, but Angel is in the name of that shelter, huge shelter. Yeah. No, that's that's excellent. It's something that I'd really like to start looking into more, and especially as we're hopefully getting out of this COVID phase and being able to interact in, with closer contact, uh, kind of reaching out and being able to have an impact on the community as well in that aspect. Um, I'll just um, insert here because I realized I forgot two things. One thing is the um, Association of Behavior Analysis International does have a special interest group for animals. Oh, so awesome. yeah, take a look at that. You know, it's it's growing, building its um, its influence over the years, and um, so you would be so welcome, all of you, to take a look at that and participate in that. And again, kind of hang around the edges and then move in ring by ring as you become better informed about what the issues and the applications are. And the other thing is, I've I've started um, on March twenty fourth, Christy Allegood who's a big contributor. Um, she's an instructor at Florida State in their behavior um, analysis department. And also uh, was, I think, really the first person to have a job in a big animal uh, industry. As she's a behavior analyst and research consultant for Animal Kingdom at Disney World in Florida, which was a huge breaking of a glass ceiling for her to be hired there um, as a behavior analyst. And um, she's going to be teaching a consuming research class under the Behavior Works banner. Mm -hmm. So if you go to behaviorworks.org under professional courses, you'll see this new one now by Christy Allegood on consuming research with an animal angle. So that's very exciting. That's um, amazing. That's great. A bit of growth. Yeah. As we kind of wrap up here for those individuals that we have listening who have pets of their own what are maybe some um i don't know just a good kind of closing remark to them some encouragement to them on how to work with their animal and help their animal have a better quality of life yeah i'm happy to be um asked that question i don't get asked it very often it's to stay very faithful, if you will, to the science that you are being educated in. That when you see an animal, including a child, who I always say are also captive animals, right? We decide what they're gonna wear, when they're gonna eat, where they're gonna go. <laughs> um, whenever an organism behaves in a way you didn't expect, it's, it's about the environment in which they're behaving, including what we do. And those lean intermittent schedules of reinforcement for undesirable behavior are very sneaky. You can hardly notice when the rate is so low that there are, we're building these persistent misbehaviors. And that's true with kids. It's true with dogs. Beware of the, I'm too tired. It's too much effort. I'm just going to put the kid in front of that TV, or I'm just going to open that door for that dog. Um, you know, you have to stay very um, faithful to the science and to understanding that everything you do and all aspects of the environment influence the behavior you're getting. So if you don't like the behavior you see, you need to go look in the mirror and do your ABCs to see how the environment's really producing that. No animal behaves for no reason. Well, thank you so much for this time. I, I think that's great for us as pet owners, as behavior analysts, even in the work that we do uh, with children to, you know, I, I talk in training about there's this balance, right, of not putting all the burden on yourself and saying, okay, this is happening. So I'm a terrible therapist. I'm, you know, a terrible behavior analyst. I failed in some way, but, you know, 
seeing, taking a step back and seeing, okay, what variables are at play? Uh, and, you know, my behavior in this moment had this reaction. So it's not that we just spin our wheels or that we give up, but we continue to look at those ABCs like you talked about. So, yeah, And, you know, we don't always have all the control. Right. I think that's really important, too. Um, when the reinforcers are coming from other children in mm -hmm. middle school or from other dog owners who have their dogs off leash, yeah. you know, we don't always have the control we need. That's different than putting the blame inside the learner to say there would be no case where you would need to say I'm a terrible therapist, only what are the variables I have to control that will influence this? And how can I control the ones that I have yet to be, be able to influence, you know? Yes. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for taking this time. It was amazing talking with you. And for just one more thing, can you talk to us about how you're going to be visiting Indiana, which you're really excited about? Oh, yes. Um, well, COVID is being the thing that is hard to control right now, but assuming that enough people are inoculated, I'm getting my second shot tomorrow. So I'm starting to feel like um, a cow that's been in the barn all winter and spring is finally here. You know, I can't wait to race through the door, um, but it, uh, hoping that everything goes well. Um, then I'll be there in June, I think it is. And I've got a crazy schedule, so I don't usually look up at dates until I'm in the month. That's and right. I'll be spending time um, doing really unfolding a very fundamental approach to understanding how behavior works. That is um, the antecedent environment in terms of context and signals and the selectors, the, the reinforcers and punishers. And I'll show lots of videos with animals about how far we've taken it so that lions and tigers and bears are offering body parts willingly for blood draws and injections and becoming a major part of their own care, which is very exciting. And um, then being able to extend that to show how they've used these strategies so well with the wolves at Wolf Park. A wonderful group of people. And they do represent this merger between behavior analysis and ethology, the study of behavior and, and the evolutionary history of animals. Um, so we really enjoy teaching and learning with each other and welcome any of you, if you can make that workshop, um, make sure to tell me that you were here today. Yeah. Well. And hopefully I'll be able to give you a hug, a proper <laughs> hug instead of an elbow bump. <laughs> Well, we're excited for your work uh, spreading to Indiana and your partnership with them. It's really amazing. I hope that I can make it there. We have a few people uh, already that are interested. And so um, thank you again. For, for oh, that's exciting. And for explaining behavior analysis as it relates to animals um, <laughs> for our folks here. Thank you so much. And thanks for your great preparation, um, <laughs> which led to important questions to me. Thank you. <laughs>